at the time that Hagainde was sworn in, he found 1.5 million metric tons of national strategic maize grain reserves. 1.5 million metric tons. Following record bumper habits in 2019, 2020, and 2021, the Food Reserve Agency had accumulated a record of 1.5 million metric tons of maize. And the storage facilities across the countries and all our maize sheds were bursting at their seams. The Food Reserve Agency had more stocks than they could handle by the time that Haga India took over government. There was also to be 3.2 million metric tons of maize to be harvested in the 2021-2022 season. And this was due to the efficient distribution of inputs under the Farmer Input Support Program arranged by the Patriotic Front Party. By the time that he took over government on the 24th of August, we had already distributed fertilizers, we had distributed seed across the country. And the farmers were ready to produce 3.2 million metric tons of maize. Add that to the 1.5 million metric tons of maize, that brought it to 4.7 million metric tons of maize. And yet what happened to that maize? I shall come to that later. Number three. By the 24th of August 2021, when BMW was sworn in as seventh Republican president, what was the exchange rate of the quach? 17 quach. Although the quach had depreciate, depreciation had reached a, re, uh, reached a low of 22.6 on 1 July 2021, by August 2021, the quach had firmly recovered and was trading between 16 and 18 quach, an average of 17 quach. By the time Mr. Idirema took over, the exchange rate, like I said, had stabilized. Has he managed to maintain it? I'll come back to that later. I'm telling the truth against the lies that they keep telling you that they found empty coffers, they found a dead economy. The fourth thing that Haga Inde Ijidema inherited from us were prices. He inherited prices from the patriotic fund. And one important price he inherited was the price of fuel. On the 24th of August, after the swearing in at uh, Hero Stadium, I went to a feeding station and I still keep the receipt. I paid 15 kwacha for a liter of petrol. On the 24th of August, 2021, I paid 15 kwacha for a liter of petrol. At that time, people had been entertained by Mr. BMW, accusing the Patriotic Front of having had middlemen in the fuel supply chain and that those middlemen were stealing three quarter per liter. He promised the people that he removed the middlemen so that the price of fuel would be 12 quarter. Today, under Mr. Calculator and his self-praising party, they have managed to increase the f price of fuel to a galloping 30 quarter when they promised five kwacha. What is very frustrating is that while the local price of fuel has increased, the international fuel price has reduced. <coughs> At paragraph 12 of this budget speech, Minister Musoko Tuane acknowledged this fact. At paragraph 12 of this speech, For the sake of clarity, let, let me quote this particular speech. He said, and I quote, paragraph 11, by the way, and I quote, 
Crude oil prices also reduced to an average of 82.8 US dollars per barrel from US dollars 104.6 dollars per barrel between 2022 and 2023. While well, there was such a huge decrease from $104 to $82, what has happened to the local prices? Have they reduced? From the time he took over government, we warned Hagainde and his government against his monthly review of fuel prices as this made economic planning very cumbersome, if not impossible. seated here in this same room speaking to you fellow countrymen and women we did warn him we told him you cannot continue to have a monthly review of your prices seated here early 2022 he did not listen he was as arrogant as ever and argued that that was the best formula we are not surprised to hear that he now has come to see what we already saw ourselves. But this also goes to show you that this is the trouble that you go into when you put people on job training. Those of us who know about governance already knew that you cannot continue like this. It has taken you more than a year to come and realize that this is wrong. Meanwhile, the economy has been damaged. Meanwhile, companies have been shut. Meanwhile, the cost of living has increased because of his poor management of the economy. Under five. I remember MCS. He warned us. I'm telling you the things that he found. So that you can compare with what they keep telling you that they found a broken economy. I've told you four things already. Number five, mini meal price. On the 24th of August, 2021, mini meal was at the highest of 120 kwacha a bag. Highest. Price. Not average, highest. 120 kwacha a bag. And now, it is no less than 320 kwacha. Even next to a milling company, it is no less than 320 kwach. In some places, the price of milling mill has gone as 400 kwach. We have also noted with disbelief that even ZNS are now involved in distributing milling mill from private millers in an attempt to bring down prices. ZNS, we saw ZNS trucks parked at private milling companies, collecting milling mill from private milling companies to try and reduce on the cost of transportation because they think ZNS is transporting for free. As if those trucks are not using fuel. Meanwhile, government milling plants that we established, we established them. Those government milling plants were established to cushion prices on the local market. Under Mr. Hagainde, he did him a BMW, capitalist of the worst kind. Those milling companies, government milling companies, Zambia National Service, Correctional Service Facilities milling companies are now being involved in exporting our maize and exporting our milling mill. You even have the bag, bags printed. Zambia Correctional Service Milling Company for export. Those companies was, were not established to export our mini meal. We established them to cushion the local market, the prices on the local market. We are also dismayed at the warped decision of selling subsidized milling mill through shoprite shops. ZNS milling mill now is being sold in shoprite shops. And some people are saying now people can go and buy milling mill from shoprite. How many of our people live in walking proximity to shoprite? 
So you expect people from my village in Kalabo to get on the bus, to get into Mongu, to go and buy minimum from ShopRite and take that Kawan bag back to Kalabo. And you see, I've reduced the price. What kind of warped thinking is this? You have increased the fuel of price and therefore you have increased the cost of transport. And you say people must travel long distances to go to ShopRite to go and buy cheap minimum. Number six. On the 24th of August 2021, when Haga Inde swore to defend the constitution of Zambia and to provide leadership to the 18 million Zambians, the majority of who are employed in the agricultural sector, more than 70% of the Zambian population are employed in the agricultural sector. Haga Inde found fertilizer at 600 kwacha, a bag. Within 24 months, 24 months, BMW has increased the cost of fertilizer to more than 1,200 kwacha a bag. <coughs> And now our people are being forced to queue up to go and receive fertilizer in dishes, in medas, and you expect that there will be a bumper harvest in Zambia. We set up the Rural Electrification, Electrification Authority with the intention of making sure that more and more Zambians have access to electricity. By 24th of August 2021, connection fees were only 700 kwach. At the highest, 700 kwach. Today, under the capitalists, for a poor villager to have the electricity dropped in their homes, for a person in Chilenje to have electricity dropped, for a person in Matero to have electricity dropped, for a person in Kawamba to have electricity dropped in their home, they have to look for 7,700 kwacha. Yeah. Number eight. The national power generation capacity, which we inherited as the patriotic front, was only 1,600 megawatts. 1,600 megawatts by 2011. By 24th of August 2021, we had ramped up this production to 3,500 megawatts. More than double. And yet Zambia's consumption at that time was only 2,200 megawatts. Meaning we had 1,300 megawatts excess power. Which at peak production we could export without causing any disturbance in the supply on the local market. One would ask, why are we facing load shedding challenges? In case you don't know. It is because of what Mr. Hagainde said. And you remember him saying that we must sell power to the regional market now. Because if we don't sell to the regional market, we're going to lose those markets. So when we have more power, there will be no market for us to sell. Meaning, still for the growth of the local economy. Build the economies of the other countries so that you can come and supply power later. Who will supply that power if all the Zambians will be dead by the time? Who will supply it? Of what use is it to supply power to educate people in Botswana, to educate people in Namibia, when your own children are not able to study because they have load shedding, which you have created by exporting power to other countries? Again, warped thinking. <coughs> Number nine. By the 24th of August 2021, 
Zambia was referred to. The whole country was referred to as a construction site. Wherever you went, you saw dust going up in the air. Dust not because of cars, dust because there was construction work taking place. Hagainde found extensive infrastructure development done with roads. And not only roads, we did bridges. And by the way, I felt extremely surprised that a man could be so engrossed in himself that he could even refer to Kazungula and say, these are the projects that we have started which is paying back. Payback period already, short payback period. And yet this is a man who criticized us when we were investing in that Kazungula bridge. I was also shocked to see him go to Kasomeno Mwenda and brag we are doing this bridge without realizing that that was the road that was left by one Nixon Chilangwa and Edgar Chagwalungu. We did airports and even as the courtesy of calling KK International Airport a sausage. And yet today when he flies in and out of Zambia like he likes to do, which is his hobby. He lands at a presidential pavilion built by us. His ministers go through an airport that we constructed. When they go to Livingston, they go to Harimwanga Kumbula Airport, which we constructed. When they go to Ndola, they go to Simon Mwansaka Puepo Airport, which we constructed. And yet they say they found a damaged economy. What chick? They found we have constructed dams. They are proud now about Mwamboshi Dam. I heard one member of parliament complaining about dams in Chirundu. Without acknowledging that those dams were initiated by the Patriotic Front government. They are bragging about having employed teachers. As though they could have employed them hadn't the PF constructed schools. Hadn't the PF constructed colleges, would they have had the teachers? Hadn't it been for the universities? By 2011, there were hardly three universities in this country. By the time we are leaving office in 2021, there were more than 15 universities government and private universities. They are bragging about employing health personnel. Could they have employed them without us having constructed health facilities? We are waiting to see the day when they will go and commission their first toilet. <laughs> So as they continue to tell lies to the world, we shall continue to remind the world of the truth. Where are we today? What is the state of the country today? Mr. Hagainde and his Minister of Finance are bragging about debt restructuring, and yet the reality is that under the new doom government, Zambia has increased debt depleted his foreign reserves, increased food insecurity, and has an unsustainable exchange rate to an extent that the World Bank in 2022, not in 2021, but in 2022, reclassified Zambia as a low-income poor country from where we left it. A low-middle-income status. Zambia has been downgraded on the level of poverty from a low middle income to now a low income poor country and people are saying they're economists they know how to manage the economy the country has also witnessed the highest cost of living ever high unemployment and high poverty levels 
the recently published Zambia Statistics Agency report on poverty assessment for 2022, which was released after conducting the eighth living conditions and monitoring survey, shows that the incidence of poverty has worsened from 54.4% to 60%. What this means, fellow countrymen and women, is that 60% of Zambians are living in abject poverty. <coughs> I'll come to this matter again a little later. The elephant in the room, the IMF. I wish to state that as far as we're concerned, this whole arrangement is just a concept of chasing the wind. The IMF discussion is chasing the wind, running after the wind. We have noted that this government has spent great effort chasing the $1.3 million billion IMF bailout package for two years. You remember they told us when they were voted in, it took the, the patriotic front years, seven years negotiating. For us, it has taken us only a few weeks. We have agreed with the IMF, $1.3 billion. We told them, we shall see. Time shall tell. And indeed, time is telling. When the IMF reached a staff level agreement with Zambia for an extended credit facility of 38 months from 2022 to 2025, there was jubilation in the UPND camp, with President Haga Inde himself leading the mockery against us in the patriotic front. However, we warned that the agreement was not an end in itself and that many processes were to be undertaken before reaching the end. Further, we expressed concern with the agreement, especially that it called for the removal of subsidies or support to fuel, electricity, agriculture, and public projects in order to allegedly restore fiscal and debt sustainability. We warned them. We said you cannot take away these subsidies. They are important. We also warned that the 1.3 billion bailout was tied to what must be a separate program referred to as a comprehensive debt treatment program under the G10 framework, G20 framework. This meant that the 1.3 billion dollars would not be released until Zambia agreed with its creditors on how the debt would be paid or treated. Not only the coalition of creditors, but also the individual creditors. We warned then. And now they were in Marrakesh. And they are telling you exactly what we warned them. Now they are saying, yes, we have reached this agreement. Now we are going to start negotiating with individual creditors. But didn't we tell you? Again, under five. And again, team we no plan. And again, job on training you get a learner driver and you tell them drive a psv truck Musafikalit. he is still learning how to engage gears that's what is happening now that's where we are as a country now musokutwane proceeded to budget for the money the 1.3 billion they were expecting from the imf they already proceeded and budgeted it and said, Yabu <laughs> and And my friend, my friend BMW also boasted how he will ensure that the entire process was completed between three and six months. They said within three and six months we'll have completed this. It's more than 24 months. And they were telling us from Marrakesh. What we told them, despite Musoko Twane's optimism and the bragging from President Hijidema, the extended credit facility 
was only approved in August 2022 by the IMF Executive Board after missing the April 2022 deadline. The work of the Official Creditors Committee only began in June 2022. And it wasn't until June 2023 that Zambia reached an agreement on debt treatment with Official Creditor Committee in line with the stringent IMF parameters. And so far, countrymen and women, only the debt regarding China has been rescheduled. And again, because of poor and careless handling of bilateral relations by BMW and his new doom government, especially with China, government missed a golden opportunity to stick to seek total cancellation or debt write-off of the Chinese debt. This is the reason why we advised that we who contracted debt, when we were contracting it, we knew how we were going to repay. And yet Hagainde lied his way through and said, me, I've already got global connections. They've already promised me 25 billion. As soon as you vote for me, the 25 billion will come in Zambia. We told you, Zambians, that we borrowed and we knew how to pay back. We would not have abandoned China. We would have been in discussion with China. We had already started discussions with China. And we did that because for us, we are non aligned. And we are not puppets of any other country. We are puppets of Zambians. And whatever we do, we put Zambians first. We don't look over our shoulders to see what is another country saying about us. No. Now they go to China after they have made numerous trips in one direction where they were receiving promises and entering MOUs which they can't make public. And they expect that China will oblige. That's a missed opportunity. Further, the debt owing to international financial institutions, commercial and private entities, remains unresolved. They have not touched it at all. It remains totally untouched. During this wind-chasing activity with the IMF, government abandoned effective plans to realize or raise domestic resources abandoned tax revenue from the mining sector that was bringing into government coffers an annual average of 1.1 billion since 2019. And that has gone from 1.1 billion dollars per year down to only 400 million dollars per year. 700 million dollars gone down the drain. Further, Economic sectors such as the agricultural sector have been bungled and are recording diminished economic activity. I heard in some speech President Haga Indejilema bragging about exporting blackberry. How many farmers in Zambia benefit from the growing of blackberry? And your president is proud. We're exporting blackberry. We're exporting blueberry. Nkasakwa just said we're exporting maruben. Because at least maruben is everywhere. People can see maruben. Now, only one farmer producing blueberry in Zambia. One farmer producing blueberry. And because the Zambians can't afford it, you export it and you brag we're exporting blueberry. At Manyozo, but. The only policies, programs, and activities making progress in Zambia, the only ones making progress in Zambia, are those that benefit foreigners. Foreign companies or companies associated with the UPND leadership and not the Zambian people. Correct. Not the Zambian people. What happened to gold in Kasensele? 
What are we hearing about Suji Light? What are we hearing about jets landing with millions of dollars and others landing with gold? Who are involved? Now, we have heard this boring song which comes out like a broken vinyl record about CDF. CDF this, CDF that. Real gentlemen, men who even have families, they have children in their homes, and they go to parliament one after another, bragging, CDF, CDF. We have increased allocation of CDF. We only were found 1.6 million. Now we have increased to 28.3 million. When you read the accounts of the 28.3 million per constituency for 2022 and for 2023, how much has been released? 5.9 million. What are you boasting about? Stop bragging. Stop it. It is immoral to go and brag before cameras and say we have increased CDF and yet in reality what you're releasing is nothing. And as a matter of fact, you even brag and say this is a way of decentralization. And yet you know that you have taken away the power from the people to decide on how to use their money. Now it is the ministers who are deciding. What decentralization is that? Every member of parliament has been instructed, and I talked about this before. Every member of parliament must go and spend one million to build a chief's palace. Even a member of parliament for Lusaka Central must build a chief's palace. A member of parliament for Kabwata must build a chief's palace. What kind of nonsense is this? And you say we're decentralizing. And bragging and bragging from start to end of the presidential speech, from start to end of the budget speech, bragging about CDF. I would like you countrymen and women to scorn upon this bragging because it is nothing but a smoke screen. You have failed to release 28.3 28 million per constituency. You only release 5.9 and you say, we are now increasing to 30.6 million. At Chiputabad. Another smoke screen, which they have been bragging about, free education, free education. Which free education? Which free education? There is no one in the UPND who introduced free education because they found it. How many children were paying for education in Zambia before UPND came into being? The 200 kwacha PTA fee that pupils were paying is only 200 kwacha to assist the running of the school. And you take away that 200 kwacha and get it back through increase of fuel, increase of minimum, and you say free education. What free education is it? What is even worse is that it is now a well-known fact that even the administrative fund support to schools is inadequate. <coughs> and now, teachers and pupils are suffering because their classrooms are overcrowded. 100, 120 children in one classroom for one teacher. And the teachers don't even have the teaching aids. I have relatives and friends in Iwengwa. And I want to tell you that my friends and relatives who are teachers in Iwengwa are regretting the introduction of this so-called free education policy because they are no longer able to raise local resources to fund the smooth operations of their schools. They are regretting. Because before they would collect the 200 quarter and make sure there is paper in the, in the school, there is stationery, there is chalk. They would make sure that there is sufficient money for them to start upgrading their classrooms 
their schools. All that now is down the drain. And education anywhere in the world is an investment by both the government and the learner or the parent of the learner. And that's what we're doing. The only difference between them and us is that we're charging 200 kwacha but provided higher quality education than them who took away the 200 kwacha and are providing poor quality education. Let me get back, my dear colleagues, to the issue of debt. Because they have kept talking about this for a long time. Not too long ago, our member of Central Committee and Bangweulu MP, Honorable Anthony Kasandwe, expressed government's high appetite for borrowing to run government. He classified, he disclosed rather, that government had borrowed $6 billion in two years. That's what he disclosed. That government had borrowed $6 billion in only two years. Government, in turn, denied the assertions, but failed. Up to now, they have failed to disprove the information. A closer look at the figures proves Honorable Kassandwe right. And this is how. According to the 2022 Annual Borrowings Plans document approved by the National Assembly, at the end of June 2022, the total stock of central government debt was $25.2 billion, which was $13.25 billion external debt and $11.95 US dollars domestic debt. And that domestic debt in terms of kwacha is 203.28 billion kwacha. Now, as an example, to meet the budget deficit in 2023, government sought parliamentary approval for their annual borrowings plan amounting to $2.22 billion. Government contracted new loans of $1.4 billion external financing from the World Bank and Africa Development Bank, among others, and $15,575,000,000 or equivalent to $760 million domestic borrowings from government bonds and treasury bills. Recently published figures by Honorable Stumbe Komuso Kotwane indicate that public debt was equivalent to $31.6 billion and $32.8 billion, including interest arrears. Sadly, their borrowings, unlike for us in the patriotic front, which went into productive sectors, their borrowings are purely for consumption and leave no tangible projects for the country. For example, in 2022, the World Bank Group, through the International Development Association, released $750 million concessional loan to Zambia, touted as the highest financing support to a developing country in a single year. Yet the country has not seen or benefited from this huge funding support. Where have we seen anything happen with that $750 million? Where? We just hear President bragging, I've sunk Kaboho in Mandevu. I've sunk Kaboho in Matero. $750 million support. Where has it gone? This reminds me to talk a little about the so-called Lusaka and Dollar Duo Carriageway. And again, they are bragging. Minister of Infrastructure is bragging. We have reduced the cost. But he's not disclosing that they have also rescoped the project. The thickness of the road we wanted to construct is more than 200% what they are working on. 
the shelf life of the road we should have done is double the lifespan of the road they want to do. Do you expect the cost to be the same? We wanted to have bypasses. They're not creating any bypasses. Do you expect the cost to be the same? What is worse is they're calling it a PPP. And they hire a foreign company, come and give it money which is locally available at NAPSA, at Workman's Compensation, money belonging to you citizens. They get it and give it as a loan to a foreign company which comes with only a briefcase. No money. They're not even tools, not even equipment. They're just coming with a briefcase or with the CASMO agreement to come and use locally available resources to construct a road in your country. And then you allow them 25 years to manage that road and to collect toll fees for 25 years. And from what they are collecting, they go back and pay you. And you say it's a PPP. I was on the road recently. They have been talking about this road since last year. And I was on this road. I've been, I've been hearing in Parliament, they are saying, we have started construction. Those of you who have been on the road, you have seen them patching. And by the way, patching with a thinner layer than what was there. Thin layer. And the question that begs an answer is, if now they are patching those potholes with a thin layer, are they going to erase the whole road once again and do a new road? No. Our position is that if indeed you have re realized that the local financial cap market has enough money to do that road, hire that Chinese company as a contractor. Let them come and construct the road, pay them. Let them go to China with what you have paid them, but let the road be managed by Zambia. Let the money from the toll fees go into treasury. You can't give away a project 25 years to a foreigner, and yet the money they are using is yours. To put simply, it is the same as a person saying, contractor, come and build a house for me. And the contractor says, okay, I'm going to borrow money from your wife. I'll build the house and allow you and your wife to live in this house for 10 years and you'll be paying me rent so that I pay back to your wife. <laughs> Let me leave that and move to a matter that is affecting all of us. Minimil. Ulutosh. And the provider of Urutosh, the agricultural sector. The Patriotic Front government, both under President Michael Chilufiasata and President Edgar Chagwalungu, recognized that the Farmer Input Support Program was a brilliant development program. <coughs> to this end, the government scaled up the program from 500,000 farmers to 1.1 million farmers who received inputs at the farm gate. The program paid off with the country recording the highest bumper harvest ever recorded, especially in 2019, when the harvest recorded was 3.7 million metric tons. The country also began to record secure food security. Further, the program supported household food security for communities in rural areas and help reduce extreme poverty. It is therefore sad to learn how this Saga Inde government is being inconsistent on the farmer input support program. One day, they say the farmer input support program is abandoned. The next day, they say it is reformed. And yet the other day, they say it is going to continue in the same format. Now the farmers don't even know is it abandoned? Is it reformed? And if it's reformed, in what form? If it's going to continue, why are you being inconsistent? Now, we're even hearing that it is going to be replaced by a Calova type of farming support called Comprehensive Workers Support Program. 
Today is the middle of October, and the modalities and guidelines of this credit scheme have not yet been worked out. Last week, Honorable MPs, if I recall, the Vice President was asked in Parliament about this program. She was asked, how is this going to work? She had no choice but to ask the Minister of Agriculture to come back at a later date to come and clarify. She did not say come back tomorrow, come back next week. She said at a later date when they are ready. Meaning they are not even ready. This is October, they are not ready. Even the Minister of Agriculture himself doesn't know how this so-called agricultural credit will work. Today, October, they don't know. The recent national crisis with maize shortages, high minimum prices is because government has bungled the agricultural sector. Your government of Haga Inde Hijidema, my friend BMW, has exported the entire grain reserves that they found. Everything they exported. And Mr. Hagainde's government continues to collect money to export more maize and midi meal, even when we don't have. They know we don't have, but they are collecting money. Bring. You heard recently how Minister of Defense, my friend Ambrose Lufuma, confirmed that government had received $15 million towards a $50 million contract to export mini meal to the Democratic Republic of Congo. They signed an agreement. We shall supply maize worth $50 million. Give us $15 million advance. Give us. Meanwhile, there is no maize. Huh? Who does that? Just who does that? HH. Indeed, HH. only HH. HH. The recent government announcement that ZNS will sell to the national, uh, they sell the, nation, the nation mini meal at a price of 230 raises more questions than answers. <laughs> Number one question where are they buying the maize? If the maize is 280 kwacha a bag, where are they buying it for them to be able to sell mini meal at 230? Who is subsidizing? Because obviously there's a subsidy here. Who is subsidizing? The other question is, the crop purchase program is almost coming to an end, and the Food Reserve Agency has only purchased 343,000 metric tons as of 25th of September 2023. This is despite offers of on-spot cash incentives and higher prices. Remember they told us, we're increasing the price to 280 so that we can encourage farmers to sell the maize. But even at 280, and promising we'll pay you cash, they only bought 343,000 metric tons. Usually, in previous seasons, under the PF, the agency would have, by now, received no less than 800,000 metric tons of maize. By now, FRA would have bought between 800,000 and 1 million metric tons of maize. Pante Pante, they increased the price and they still fail to buy the maize. That's the reason why I said yesterday, thank God we lost elections. So that you Zambians can know the difference between governors and destroyers. The failure for them to buy maize shows that there is no maize on the market. There is nothing. So then the question is, where will ZNS get the maize for them to run their program and to make it sustainable? Where will they get the maize from? There is no maize on the market. Will they go and buy the maize from FRA at 280 kwacha and sell the minimum at 230? Number two, ZNS sells minimum at their own depots and outlets at 150 kwacha per, per 25 kg bag. Why is government now selling the same mini meal at 230 through ShopRite? Why? At their own meals, they are selling for 150. 
They are subsidizing up to 150. And they deliver it to ShopRite and sell it for 230. Why? Do they want all Zambians to go to ZNS milling plants? How can you run an economy like that? Number three. Although the initiative to build industrial milling plants under the ZNS, for us, our goal was best in the country engaging in massive production to help keep the price of milling mill down. Like I said earlier, for them, even without sufficient maize, they are using these milling plants to export. And you expect that the prices of milling mill in Zambia will reduce. This is October, and the price is already at 320. I can assure you, Zambians, that come February 2024, Hagainde was saying, when I come, you have three square meals a day. I can assure you that the majority of Zambians will have half a meal a day. Once a week. <laughs> Indeed. Just Once a week. Because the mini meal will be unaffordable because the maize will not be there. You remember that already last year and early this year, Haga India was exporting GMO mini meal. Now I can assure you, he will even be tempted to bring yellow mini meal meant for cattle feed from Brazil. Nipanotuli. My dear countrymen and women, I've spoken so much about these matters of mismanagement of our country by Haga Inde Ijilema. Allow me to move to the patriotic front. Number one, our Central Committee was scheduled to have its meeting, Central Committee meeting, this Saturday. 21st of October 2023. However, that meeting has been moved to Sunday 22nd October 2023. This is to give an opportunity for our leaders to mourn Bishop Dr. Peter Nlovu, who will be put to rest on Saturday 21st October 2023. I therefore call upon all our Lusaka best members all our Lusaka best leaders, all our members of parliament who will be based in Lusaka on the 21st to kindly attend the burial service of Archbishop Peter Nlovo. Number two, we have instructed our party structures across the country that while they continue with their very impressive use of WhatsApp groups, and social media platforms, they should now also embark on active physical campaigns to mobilize membership and the public. We have encouraged the structures to submit notices to the police for the party to hold mass rallies across the country. We are not pleading with the police. It is our right, our constitutional right. Number three, utilization of other public gatherings. We implore our members to ensure that they attend all public functions such as funerals, weddings, prayer sessions, traditional ceremonies, sports activities, etc., etc., within their communities so that they utilize them to sensitize the members of the public on how the PF government delivered development during the period 2011 to 2021. This will also accord all of us an opportunity to do what the others don't want to see us doing, to regroup. We know that they get very annoyed when they see us regrouping, but regrouping we shall. Whether they like it or not, regrouping, we shall. So let us regroup through funerals. Let us regroup through weddings. All members of the party in your communities, please go and attend funerals. 
Don't shy away. Number four. Day of national prayer. We have requested all our members to participate in the activities of the National Day of Prayer, Fasting and Reconciliation, which falls on Wednesday, 18th, October 2023. We want to implore all Zambians to also observe this day. Please don't be discouraged. All Zambians, my fellow countrymen and women, Zambia was first declared by David Livingston when he knelt down in Chitambo Mission, when he said, upon this soil shall emerge a nation of Christians. It was followed up by the declaration by Frederick Chiluba that Zambia is a Christian nation, which was reaffirmed by Edgar Chagwalungu, who declared the 18th day of October as a day of reconciliation, a day of prayer. Don't be discouraged by the one person who said this 18th day of prayer is a useless day. For us Zambians, it is not a useless day. Prayer for us can never be useless. So I appeal to all of us Zambians, please don't be discouraged by those words. Let those who think that 18th of October is a useless day, let them go and do things that are unbiblical and Christian on that day. For all of us Zambians, if we can't join the body of Christ across the country where there are activities, even in your own home on that day, kneel down and pray to God. Reconcile first of all with yourself. Reconcile with your family. Reconcile with your neighbors. Reconcile with one another and reconcile with God. On that day, members of Patriotic Front and all peace-loving citizens of Zambia, let us go on our knees and pray to God. 24th of October, 1964. Some people had not yet been born. Others like Uriana Ishiva, was only two years old. And therefore had nothing to do with the Independence Day. And therefore has no choice in the matter. All of us in the Patriotic Front and all countrymen and women, I implore you to observe Independence Day celebrations. All of us, let us go and participate. Whether those events are organized by the state or not, let us go and celebrate because that's our Independence Day. And we owe it to our forefathers. Blood was spilled for Zambia to be clear, declared an independent state. So please let us observe that day. However, I want to inform you that our participation in official activities and state functions shall be a subject of review at our next Central Committee meeting. But before that, I would just like to encourage all of us to observe that day. 28th of October, as you are all aware, this year marks the ninth anniversary since the passing of Zambia's fifth Republican president and founding father of the Patriotic Front, President Michael Chilufiasata. I would like to encourage all our members to observe that day. We have asked our provincial leaders in all the provinces in the country to notify the police that on that day they are going to hold commemoration of the anniversary, the ninth anniversary of the passing of President Michael Chilufiasata in the provincial headquarters. For Lusaka province, they are also instructed to put notice to the police that we commemorate this day. And I implore all members of the party who shall be in Lusaka to come and join us, first of all, at the memorial site.
and then at a place that we shall be informed through the provincial committee. Finally, finally, as a party, we have declared October 28th the day that we honor the memory of our founding president and the fifth Republican president of Zambia, a man who contributed immensely to multi-party democracy in this country, a man who founded the most formidable political party in Zambia, the Patriotic Front. In honor of his memory, 28th of October is hereby declared a green day. We therefore encourage all members of our party and members of the public on that day to wear green. On the 28th of October, let us all wear green or a piece of green on whatever we shall be wearing. This will be in memory and honor of President Michael Chirufia Sata's contribution to this country. Those of us who will be attending the memorial of President Sata, without exception, we must have something green wherever we shall be. Members of the press and our followers across the country, I thank you most sincerely for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a comprehensive statement delivered by our acting president.